Do you want to make a vampire movie? Let's make a vampire movie. This episode of The Vampire's Castle, we're going to be starting a new series called Your Vampire Movie, in which we talk about how to make your very first vampire short film or feature. So every year I teach a class uh, at Comic-Con San Diego called Comic-Con Film School. And this is going to be different from that. Uh, we're going to be going over a bunch of different stuff. But one thing that is the same is that I want to, I want to impart to you that you do not need to spend $30,000 of a relative's money in order to make your first movie. In fact, you really should not do that uh, because I have never seen that situation end well. So a couple weeks ago, I premiered one of my vampire movies and that's called Black Ambient Journal of a Vampire Hunter. It is 45 minutes long and I made it with six friends of mine for a total budget of $300. And you can do this exact same thing. So I'll be using some clips from Black Ambient in this video to illustrate sort of the points that I'm talking about. But if you want to see the movie in its entirety without me talking over it, then you can go check that out right here or I will put a link below in the comments so at any point you can just jump right over there if you want. So Black Ambient was my thesis project for, for film school and this was some years ago. But when somebody says film school thesis project, you're probably thinking about, you know, like a budget of $20,000 and like, you know, massive cameras and building sets and, you know, studios with studio lighting and a big crew of 37 people. And that's cool if you have those kinds of resources, but I had zero dollars. And I'm just going to assume that you're in the same boat that I was in. So before we get into the how, Let's talk about the what. And this is the question that starts off the entire process, and that's inspiration. What is your movie about? Now, inspiration can come from anywhere. Uh, it can come from uh, an idea that you have for a character. It can come from uh, watching a movie and that you really love, or you find something in that movie that you want to riff on. Uh, it can come from the lyrics of a song that inspires you to some imagery. You could be like Stephanie Meyer and you could have a dream about a girl and a vampire lying in a field of flowers and that can be the kernel for your entire, your entire vampire project. And any of these are completely valid and inspiration can come from anywhere. And, and inspiration will be different for each person and it will actually be different for each project that each person makes. But here's where the inspiration meets the asphalt. Is your inspiration conducive to making a movie? And is it conducive to making a movie within your resources? So like, for example, I would love to see like a sprawling epic vampire saga that's like a Game of Thrones size multi-season television show about, you know, romance and vampire war and all of it taking place spread out across multiple kingdoms beneath a, you know, cloud and shrouded moon. But nobody's going to make that because that would cost a billion dollars. So that is firmly in the realm of your Netflixes and your Disneys and your Warner Brothers and, and those places. So if your inspiration leads you down one of those paths, that's fine. But then your inspiration becomes a novel or it becomes a screenplay or it becomes a role-playing game or something that is within your resources to actually make. A movie is a thing that has real world physical requirements and it takes a group of people working together in order to make that happen. So that immediately grounds us very much in the real world of what is possible. And so not all ideas are going to be right 
for making a movie. And most ideas are not going to be right for someone making a movie without a budget, like us. So, how do we go about doing this? So it turns out that there is kind of a magical formula for doing this. And I've never shared this with anybody else. Uh, I've never said this anywhere else. So this is just for you guys. And this is what's going to separate the people who dream from the people who actually make and finish something. So here we go. This boils down quite simply to four questions. The first question is, what kind of a movie do you want to make? The second question is, what are the things that you have? The third question is, who are the people that you know? And the fourth question is, where do you live? Those are the four immutable factors about how your vampire movie gets made. That is your sandbox to work in. That is your studio, that is your creative space. Everything else you can figure out how to make happen. But these are the four pillars upon which we are going to build your dark castle. So let's go through these and uh, I'll, I'll use some, uh, some clips from Black Ambient to kind of explain what I'm talking about here. So the first one is, what kind of movie do you want to make? That's a pretty simple question, and we've actually already answered it. We want to make a vampire movie. Great. First question's taken care of. We can move on. The second question is, what do you have? This is as simple as it sounds. Do, do you have a car? Great. You're shooting a scene in your car. Does, uh, does your mom have kind of a weird little statue figurine sitting on the mantle? Because that can be the cursed idol that your vampires are fighting over or trying to get their hands on. Do you have a wooden fence? Because that's where your vampire is going to get staked and killed. Do you have a friend with a samurai sword? Well, well now you've got a sword in your movie. Do you have a friend who has a cool gothic jacket? Do you have a friend who has a rad telescope? Because now you've got a scene where the girl who loves astronomy is out in a field at night and a vampire just happens to walk up to her. And now that relationship can begin. When I set out to make Black Ambient, I, I went through and I figured out what are the things that I have that could look cool on camera? And what did I have? Uh, my friend Megan, uh, her family had just moved into a house that had a pool. Oh my God, there are gonna be a lot of scenes around that pool. Uh, my parents had a van. Uh, I had a cousin who was in archery classes and had a super dope bow. I had another friend who had an unfinished basement that kind of looked like a murder basement. Cell phones, believe it or not, were really expensive back then, and most people didn't have them. But I found one that was a toy in a toy store for like six bucks that, from a distance, looked real, and when you pressed a button on it, it made a ringing sound. So, hooray! We had high-end technology to go on screen. Now, that may seem like a pretty small pile of stuff, but that stuff was built into a whole 45 minute movie. I mean, look at this. I have people learning how to fight vampires with a broomstick and a pillow. You got this. So keep all that in mind and let's move on to question number three. And that is, who do you know? Now, in Los Angeles, when somebody says that, it's about like, well, who are the famous people that you're connected to? Or who, who do you know who is rich? I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about who do you know in your life who can give your movie some production value? Now, what am I talking about here? For example, do you have a friend who owns a car dealership? Really? That's great. 
Now, one of your main characters works at a car dealership. Or they are applying for a job at a car dealership. Or they get fired from a car dealership at the beginning of the movie. Or they go and visit their boyfriend who works at a car dealership. Your movie doesn't have to take place around a car dealership. I mean, it can. But just having that place in one scene adds production value to your movie. Do you have a friend who lives in a house where uh, it's sort of their property backs up on like an open field or a forest or something like that? That's great. Now you've got scenes that you can shoot in a field or forest and you've got a house right next door where people can go and they can go in and get cool or get warmed up or use the bathroom or hang out in or get some food. You've got a base of operations right next to some gorgeous production value. Do you take karate lessons? Well, now all of your classmates can be in a scene where your main character joins the underground monastery of martial artists who are learning the fighting art of how to combat vampires. That's amazing. But this also extends to who do you know who can be on camera? And that can be as relevant as who do you know who can act? But it's also who do you know who looks interesting? Who, who do you know who is attractive? Who do you know who looks like a grizzled old biker? Who do you know who looks like a private detective? Who do you know who has an interesting face? Who do you know who has an, a, a fantastic smoker's voice? And these people do not necessarily have to be main characters who have to carry the bulk of the dialogue, but they're going to make excellent texture when you get them on camera. Speaking of cameras, who do you know who has one? Who do you know who works in some form of media already? And that can be anything from shooting shooting wedding videos, or working in corporate videos, or working at your local news affiliate. These are people who already have not only camera understanding, but production experience, and they would probably love to actually shoot something that is creative and narrative. And they might already have some equipment to do that. For Black Ambient, I knew that my sister was a photographer. So better believe there were going to be some scenes that revolved around photographs. Uh, my friend, a uh, friend of mine from high school, Brian, was in broadcasting school at the time. And so he was awesome with a camera. So he was definitely going to be my director of photography. My friend Amanda's mom was the manager of an apartment complex with a parking lot and a spooky garage. So now you're probably going through the people in your life and who you actually know. And that's good. So let's move on to the last question. Where do you live? And whatever the answer is to that question, the place where you live is an amazing place to make a movie. And unless you, are, you happen to be living in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, wherever you live has never been seen before. We have never seen the places you know about on screen before. The place where you live has buildings, and it has houses, and it has parks, and it has markets, and fields, and forests, and rivers, and mountains, and seasons, and culture. All of these things are amazing for us to see, for you to get on camera, and are going to make your movie unique and uniquely yours. So much of the stuff that we ingest, either by reading or watching, uh, as popular culture-wise, especially when it comes to vampires, takes place in, you know, the big urban centers. L.A., New York, uh, Louisiana, for sure. Uh, 
especially when it comes to vampire stories, but like also like London and Paris and and so we're so accustomed to like thinking of these places as like these are the shadowy urban sprawl places full of culture and art and crime and these are the places where we expect vampires to be because that's what we're used to reading. And so there's a bit of a trap in thinking that like, oh, I really want my vampire story to take place in one of those places. But here's the thing. You have a cemetery too. You have a place that looks spooky. And you have a place that looks posh. And a place that looks funky. And we've never seen a vampire in those places before. And what is that like? And what are they like when they're there? So lean in to what you have. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. And when I say that, probably the first things that come to mind are like, oh, uh, cows, hay bales, fields of corn. But Omaha is actually the biggest city in Nebraska. And it's got a pretty large downtown area, and it's got uh, a portion of downtown that uh, has been preserved from the way that it looked back in the 1930s with brick streets and old architecture, but it also has the suburbs and has some amazing nooks and crannies and just very cool places. And by leaning into the idea of Omaha Vampire Hunters, I wound up with all kinds of cool locations and just great texture in the city that I lived in in order to tell my story. All without spending any money. So let's watch the opening scene here and I will show you the examples of all these things that I'm talking about. Starting right off the bat, we're in a car. This is free to shoot. This is totally free to shoot. Uh, we've got our two actors up in the front seat. Uh, I'm sitting in the back along with my director of photography while he's shooting this. This is actually his car. Uh, and so, so thank you, Brian, for letting, letting our actors uh, drive your car. Um, you know, we're just kind of driving through any old neighborhood here in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, look, that's my parents' house. Yes, my parents' house. That's where we're shooting on this particular night and you should do the same thing. Uh, so we're pulling up here uh, on the street. Now, I did go through a couple days before and I went to every single house on the street and I just knocked on the door and I said, hey, by the way, I, you know, I grew up right down here on the corner um, and in a couple nights, I'm going to be shooting a scene uh, for a movie that's about vampires. So if you see some people dressed in black running around out there with some bows and arrows, that's what that is. Don't worry about that. Uh, as we come up here, uh, you'll see we've got some walkie-talkies that I borrowed from a friend. Uh, we've got uh, one of the characters. One of the characters here has a bow slung over her shoulder. That's the bow that I borrowed from my cousin. Uh, you're going to see here in a second. There's going to be a uh, ring of the phone. That is not a real cell phone. That is the toy. There's the toy cell phone. Another actor sitting in my mom's van, which is now the van that the vampire hunters drive around in. So, uh, so we've got a little more dialogue here, and then we're kicking off the action. It's my opinion that we should always, you should always open on an exciting scene. Uh, that just makes, makes it easier for the audience to get into a movie. This is the front door of the house I grew up in. We're knocking on that. So we've got our cast of uh, vampire hunters here. And then the composer opens the door and we throw him out of the way, go running downstairs. And here's our vampire, bam, hits the cameraman, goes out running. Our archer fires an arrow. We cut and then cut back to a new edit of our vampire hitting the ground after we've spent about a half an hour rigging him up with an arrow sticking out of his shirt with blood all over it. And this is just right on the corner where I walked to school for 12 years. 
and now here I am killing a vampire on the corner. Uh, so how much did this scene cost? Nothing. It didn't cost anything. The, the one actual material cost for this scene was food for the actors. Food, sodas, you know, water, beverages. Uh, my mom, uh, my parents were, oh, there's my mom's van again. My parents were very nice and they were like, you know, the thing that we want to donate to your movie is we'll provide a spread of food for all your actors. So there we are. And that was, that was their, so they are producers on the movie because they probably spent, you know, probably 50 or 60 bucks on, on food. And look, a swimming pool. Now, so that was the entire opening scene of my Vampire Hunter movie shot for zero dollars. So if you wanted to get really technical and, and assume that there were things in there that I didn't already own, uh, $6 for a toy cell phone, that's not an issue these days anymore. Um, you know, we, I maybe spent $2 on a roll of duct tape uh, but probably used one that was already in the garage in order to make a thing for the arrow to stick out of. Uh, that white t-shirt, maybe that was three or four dollars, uh, but again, I just used one that I already had uh, and just gave that to the actor to wear, and then we messed it up. The blood was a little two dollar vial of fake blood that I got at the Halloween store. The arrow, the arrow, again, already had just, you know, sawed off the end of it and then stuck it with the duct tape to the actor. I mean, that arrow, you could honestly buy at a toy store. It does not need to be a full, like, expensive arrow. But even if you wanted to do that, that's $6, $8. So you could argue maybe I spent, you know, I could have spent... $20 on that scene, and that's fair, but that's $20 for the opening scene of the movie. Now, you're probably thinking, what do you have that you could use for the exciting opening scene of your vampire movie? And that's great. Your movie is waiting for you to walk outside your door and to find it. And you don't need to go borrow $20,000 in order to make it look cool. You just need to tap into what you already have and grow your movie out of that. And it will be the awesome thing that only you could make. So that's, that's the first part. So in this series, in the upcoming episodes, uh, and if you're watching this a little bit later, then they'll all be in this playlist. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, screenwriting for, for your particular vampire movie. We'll talk about how to cast it with actual trained actors. Uh, we'll, talk about, uh, we'll talk about cameras and equipment. We'll talk about uh, some fundamentals of photography. Uh, we'll talk about editing, all kinds of stuff. And in the meantime, we also have a series called Your Vampire Project, which is tons of episodes about things to think about for your vampire story. So feel free to check those out as well. So a link to Black Ambient can be found below. Uh, so you can watch that and perhaps take some inspiration for how to make your own vampire movie. And the next episode here on The Vampire's Castle, uh, I'm going to get some of the cast and crew and you can hear about how I found these folks and why they gave me their time and expertise without getting paid and just sort of what a small production runs like. And we've got some really funny stories that went into making this project. Uh, so definitely come back and check that out. But in the meantime, you've got a movie to make and we can't wait to see it. <laughs>